uh, or as we used to know it in those days, United Distillers. Uh, and that was uh, not in, uh, in Europe, but was actually first in Korea and later in Singapore, uh, where I was for, for those four years, uh, Mr. Johnny Walker in that area, uh, and I still enjoy a glass of scotch. So it's a great pleasure to be here again, um, and great pleasure to be sharing a platform with uh, Philip. Uh, both he and I have occasionally got into a certain amount of trouble with the, uh, uh, the bosses of the Conservative Party, so I do very much uh, sympathise with the uh, problems that he's faced. I think it's fair to say that we're both on the Conservative wing of the Conservative Party <laughs> uh, and extremely happy to be there. Now you may say, what's this guy uh, coming up from the East Midlands uh, to talk to us about uh, energy and climate change and nuclear power for? Uh, well, I am a member of the European Parliament's Temporary Committee on Climate Change. Incidentally, I was in one of their meetings only, was it only yesterday? Extraordinary. Um, and they were having a long discussion about actually making the Temporary Committee permanent. Um, and I thought of Parkinson's Law, you know, the work fully uh, expanding to fill the available time. And it was just a classic example of a bureaucracy that won't go away. They had an 18-month mandate, but this is so important uh, that they've got to go on permanently. I've also spent a lot of time with um, uh, a group in the Parliament called the European Energy Forum uh, and followed energy issues very closely. I went with them to a nuclear power station in Finland called Olkiluoto, and I'll come back to that uh, in a minute if I may. Now, I'm not here tonight to talk to you about climate change, although I could if you wanted me to. Uh, and, um, uh, I have very strong views about it. I've distributed copies of my leaflet uh, with the pin-up species of the climate change hysterics, uh, the polar bear on the front. Um, I hope you'll enjoy that. Uh, but we're not here to talk tonight about climate change. Whether you believe that climate change is happening and is caused by carbon dioxide emissions, or whether you don't, there are still powerful reasons to be in favor uh, of nuclear. And um, I would say uh, the, the one place where I would disagree uh, with our good colleagues who are opposing wind farms, and by the way, I'm opposing wind farms in Leicestershire, and my wife tomorrow night will be out on the streets of the next village uh, supporting uh, a local group there at their village street fair uh, who are opposing uh, Leicestershire wind farms. So we feel very strongly about this. Where I disagree is that you are not against wind farms as such, you are merely in favor of keeping your local park free of industrialization. I support you in that objective, but I have to say that I myself am against wind farms per se, and I will tell you why. First, because I don't believe that even if you're worried about CO2 emissions, they actually save very much <coughs> CO2. And secondly, because uh, as I think Philip has, has already mentioned, they cannot be justified in economic terms. They produce a trickle of very expensive electricity, the renewable obligation certificates that force electricity suppliers to use so-called renewable energy are actually pushing up what you and I are paying in our electricity bills today. We may be complaining about the price of power when you pay for your electricity. Remember, you're actually paying for these uh, wind turbines that deliver so little uh, electricity. And I'm absolutely fascinated by that film of, of the, it was in Ireland, wasn't it, that, the, yes. the, the, the beat thing. I'll tell you why, because I went to an excellent seminar conducted in the European Parliament, organized by Struan Stevenson, whom I hope you will know of, who is your, uh, one of your two conservative uh, MEPs for Scotland. And he had there a group of experts, I can't remember who they all were now, but they were experts from, from universities, making a very important point. If you put a wind farm on ordinary soil or on rock, you can have a discussion about whether it might save as much CO2 as it costs to put it there. If you put a wind farm on peat, then there is absolutely no question that you will never, ever, ever get back in CO2 savings the amount of CO2 you have released. And that's for a very simple reason. To put up one of these very large modern wind turbines, you need an enormous mass of concrete to hold it steady. You have to dig out a hole equivalent to a, a pair of semi-detached houses and fill it with concrete. You dig out that amount of peat, even if it doesn't slide down the hill and make a mudslide, you will release the CO2 that has been held in that peat for possibly thousands, possibly tens of thousands of years. And the amount of CO2 you release in that process will never ever be recovered by that wind farm. And the experts they had from universities who studied these matters and understand it were absolutely firm on that. Now, the fact is that the best wind in the United Kingdom 
uh, is found on the western side, coming in off the Atlantic. It's found in Wales, Simon. Um, and it's found particularly in Scotland. And unfortunately, the areas with the best wind tend to be peat landscapes. And much of the area, and I assume I haven't studied the geology of your park there, I assume it is on peat. Even if you can justify wind farms elsewhere, you cannot ever justify wind farms on peat. And I would recommend you, as part of your campaign, please talk to Stuart Stevenson, because he's got the facts at his fingertips, uh, and that objection ought to be going forward. There is no justification for putting wind farms uh, on peat. It is, uh, it is on, our, uh, on our objection form. Excellent, good, well, well done. But as I say, it is worth talking to Stuart, because he's, he's really hot on that, and I'm sure he would, he would wish to be supportive. Now, um, Philip has already mentioned the report uh, of, of Professor Fells from Newcastle University. I happen, to, um, I happen to have a copy of it here. I've been reading it in the last couple of days, and indeed I've made my notes for what I want to say tonight. Don't worry, I won't go on too long because there is food and there, is, uh, there are drinks afterwards, so I shall be as quick as I can. We in this country, as Philip has made very clear, are facing a crisis, and I agree with Philip. Whatever you think about climate change, the biggest threat to the fabric of our society that I can see today, and it's an immediate threat over the next 10 years, it's not 50 years or 100 years, it is in our lifetimes, we are looking at rolling blackouts, we are looking possibly at an economic disaster, we are looking possibly at social unrest and the breakdown of the fabric of society. It is that serious. It is much more serious than, than anything which is conceived of realistically uh, on the climate change front. The government is bound, and we come back to the European Union, it wouldn't be a speech from me if I didn't take a, swipe, a side swipe of Brussels, so I hope you will forgive me for that. Um, but Brussels has handed out targets for renewable energy. And the target for Britain is 15%, which doesn't sound too bad, except that you can't put uh, renewable energy very conveniently into transportation. So it all has to come from electricity generation. And if you convert that into electricity generation, it's not 15%, it's 40%. And most of that 40% is due to come from wind, and it's due to come by 2020. Well, as Professor Fells explains perfectly clearly, they want 7,000 offshore wind turbines. In the areas they want to put them, you can only erect them for 60 days of the year because the weather's too bad the rest of the time. That will be 10 a day for every available day between now and 2020. We only have one ship which is capable of planting these things. Nobody can plant 10 of them a day. It simply cannot be done. Now, we have a government that had targets for child poverty. It is failing to meet them. It had targets for fuel poverty. It is failing to meet them. In fact, the thing is getting worse. It has a whole series of targets for this and that and the other. It has a target for house building, which we heard only today will take at least nine years longer to achieve than they said. The government cannot achieve targets. Now, I had a proper job before I got into politics, and I know a bit about planning businesses. And there is no point on earth in having a target unless you have a plan and you have resources and facilities and you are going to meet the target. Uh, politicians love to have a target for 10 years' time because they know they won't be in office in 10 years' time. What pledges can you remember from 1998? The politician said, in 10 years' time, we're going to do something. None. You will not be, as a politician, you will not be held to account for something you promise in 10 years, but you may get a decent headline out of it. And that's why they love these targets. There is no plan and there is no credibility to their targets because they simply cannot be achieved. And yet they are relying on them and they are failing to build the coal and the nuclear that we need to fill that gap. The plans are simply unachievable. But I tell you what, even if they were achievable, <coughs> even if they could build all the wind, for, the wind turbines they reckon they're going to build, it would still not power the grid. And again, I can tell you why very clearly, and you can talk to people in the industry and they will tell you, if you have 2% of your generation from wind, you can cope with it. If you have 5% or 10%, you can cope with it. If you get up to about 15%, you start running into serious problems for the very simple reason that wind is randomly unpredictable. You do not know when it's going to blow. Uh, it can be, uh, you can have a high pressure area over the whole of Britain and, and no wind blowing for a couple of days. That can happen in the middle of winter when you have peak demand, everybody wants electricity, uh, and there isn't any. Now you can balance that out against other sources of supply. If you have a very small proportion of wind, you cannot at 15% and above, and at 40% it is frankly absurd. So even if they could build them, it still wouldn't work.